So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Adam Clark. He will be speaking to us today about recent activities at NOAA Hazardous Weather Test Spring Forecasting Experiments. Uh, Adam is a federal research meteorologist at NOAA's NSSL, and he's also an affiliate associate professor in the School of Meteorology at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, Adam's research involves developing model diagnostics, verification, and visualization strategies for high-resolution ensemble forecasting, and exploring model physics sensitivity and predictability at convective scales. He is also one of the lead planners and facilitators for the annual NOAA HWT, or Hazardous Weather Test Bed Spring Forecast Experiment, and that's what we'll be hearing about today. Uh, these experiments convene research and forecasting experts from around the world to improve predictions of severe weather hazards. Um, during his career so far, Adam has received uh, several significant high honors, including the Iowa State University um, College of Liberal Arts and Sciences Young Alumni Award in 2017. Go Cyclones. <laughs> the Dean's Award for Excellence in Research and Scholarship from the University of Oklahoma. And the, that was in 2014. And the Presidential Early Career Award Scientist and Engineers in 2012. So with that, um, I'll let Adam get started. And thanks for being here. All right. So I just turned on my mic. It sounds like it's working, right? Mm -hmm. OK, cool. Um, thanks, Jamie. Yeah, so um, I guess I'll just give a warning at the outset. I have, oh, good, Greg's here. Hey, Greg. Um, so I've got um, a lot of eye candy, a lot of animations, um, and not a lot of hard science. But hopefully what I present can spur some ideas for um, for the research. And a lot of these things are projects that we have ongoing at NSSL, um, things that we've recently done in the HWT, uh, and that you know we're currently compiling results on and doing research on. So um, I will jump right into it. Uh, so the spring forecasting experiment, we do it every year. It's five weeks long. Uh, the whole idea behind it is that uh, we take these emerging concepts and technologies uh, that we're developing uh, at NSSL and at other government laboratories and, and even products that are being developed uh, at universities, um, and we see if we can, uh, well, first of all, test them to see whether they work well and then try to accelerate them uh, into operations. So, uh, and another big component of recent experiments has been documenting the sensitivities and the performance characteristics of convectional allowing models. Um, and so now in the HWT, we have a lot of funded projects um, and a lot of different groups of collaborators that contribute uh, these CAM ensembles. So uh, what's great about the HWT, um, the HWT is, is in the National Weather Center building where uh, we have a bunch of different uh, you know, weather agencies. Uh, and the HWT itself is right between the Storm Prediction Center and then the local um, National Weather Service uh, forecasting office. And there's windows on, on either side. So you can see into the ops area for both of those uh, forecast agencies. So it's, it's kind of a neat atmosphere. Um, and during the experiments, we're... Uh, issuing the same types of products that operational forecasters issue. Um, we're abiding by uh, the, kind of the constraints and the deadlines um, that these forecasters have, and we're also using similar workstations um, to what they use. So there's this real sense of uh, well, realism and then operational urgency during the experiment. Uh, we also try to get a really uh, diverse set of participants. So um, you know, we, we want to be able to put researchers, forecasters, uh, professors, and students, you know, all in the same uh, room together, um, which makes it fun, um, really engaging. You get a lot of different perspectives um, that way. Um, and it's just a, a kind of a neat uh, environment. Um, you know, you bring a student in and they can make all these different connections with, you know, maybe forecasting people and researchers and whatnot. So, uh, and we like to uh, kind of facilitate what we call these R2O and O2R pathways. So, um, you know, obviously we're trying to transition these uh, products and accelerate them into operations. Um, but we're also trying to learn um, what forecasters 
really need. Um, and so we're taking things back with us that we learned from forecasters so that we can kind of gear our own research um, to better help them um, you know, when they're at the desk. Uh, and we produce a lot of publishable um, science, which, which is important to us um, as researchers. Um, so we've been really productive in working, collaborating, and also doing our own um, research from the data sets that we generate in the HWT. Okay, so this, these are the participants from this year. And this is pretty much what, what happens every year is we say, uh, you know what, we really need to, you know, we, we've had too many people in the previous years. We need to, like, cut it off at a certain number. So we had this soft cutoff that I've marked there. Um, and then... We, we were like, uh, we need to invite you know, these people. And so we're like, okay, we're going to make this a, a hard cutoff now. We're going to be um, you know, big jerks and reject people. And then it's like, you know, so-and-so from this lab who's really involved in some really interesting research, they want to come. Or so-and-so who is a manager here and we can't really say no to, um, they want to come. <laughs> and so this is what happens. We just say, screw it, whatever. Uh, and, and we end up inviting like whoever wants to come. <laughs> so um, uh, we have a lot of people, over like 100 people, I think, went through the doors of the HWT this year. Um, and, and we also had uh, kind of a separate experiment for our, the Warner Forecast program at NSSL. So we had additional people that came through because of that. And then we have all the facilitators, um, which are many. I have those listed there. Um, and then uh, we had facilita facilitators for the Warn and Forecast component of the experiment, too. So, so the, here, here are uh, the people that came this year. Um, I think by week five, maybe we just got really lazy and we forgot to take the picture because I couldn't find the week five uh, <laughs> picture. So uh, anyway, you can I have the same shirt on in two of those pictures. But I guess I like to wear this same shirt on Fridays. But uh, anyway... So uh, just to give you an idea of what our schedule looks like, um, kind of the format of the experiment is we divide people um, into uh, two separate desks. They switch desks during the week. We call one desk the severe hazards desk and the other desk the innovation desk. At severe hazards, um, we do things that are more geared towards um, products and outlooks that are close to being operational. Operational At the innovation desk, we're more kind of experimenting, you know, things uh, that we're uh, looking into uh, may not have a clear path to operations or it may be, you know, maybe a few years into the future. Um, so we start, our, we start off our morning by looking at forecasts that we issued from the previous day and evaluating them. And so this is, uh, I, I won't go through what all the, uh, different experimental outlooks were, but that's what we do first thing in the morning. That usually takes about uh, 45 minutes. Then we uh, do uh, we we start to uh, get ready to do our outlooks for that day. Part of that process. Um, we make everybody, uh, we force them to, we, we beat them if they don't do it. We make them do their own hand analyses, um, which uh, for the forecasters that are there um, may be really easy. But for maybe the students and the researchers that haven't done a hand analysis since graduate school, it, it can be a bit of a challenge. I get out of doing these, which I'm very happy about, because I have to get ready for the next activity. So I, I kind of disengage um, during that period. Um, but one of the neat things that um, we did this year is we decided that we would, you know, th these hand analyses are just, especially the people who are experts at them, it's just amazing to see um, how they do them and what they come up with when they do these. Just from these, you know, you look at a map and it's just a bunch of numbers and it's like, what, you know, how are you going to get something out of this? And someone like Lance Bozart comes along and he sees all of this, you know, all of these like super insightful things in this map. And so I was like, you know what, we're going to do a time lapse of Lance Bozart um, <laughs> doing a map analysis. And so this is, I thought it would be cool to show this. Uh, here's Lance doing his thing. Now, most of the time, Lance, it'll take him like 10 or 15 minutes to do one of these. I timed it. This one took him 45 minutes, and what? he wanted to do a really good job because he, he had this camera hovering over him, you know? <laughs> so. I see the eraser showing up a lot. Yeah, oh, yeah. 
at one point, if you look really closely, there you'll, you'll see a third hand that comes in. And I think it was Steve Weiss who, who was, wanted to comment on something that he was seeing in there. <laughs> but you have to look really closely to, to see that. And he'll take his glasses off, you know, from time to time. And so this is kind of fun to watch. <laughs> was the trough in the West, was there a severe weather this day in Oklahoma? Yeah, I can't remember which day. It might have been, I want to say, like May 13th or something. Oh, the date's on there. Yeah, yeah. so uh, May, 17th. May 17th. So, yeah, it was a 700 mil bar analysis, and that's the end product. Um, so... Let's see if I can get it to show up. Oh, and the credit for that time lapse goes to James Mernon, who's our audiovisual person at, at NSSL. So he was very nice. I asked him the day before, I was like, would it even be possible to do this? And he's like, oh, yeah, we'll do it. So uh, big, big kudos to him. And this was, I thought this was a great picture of Lance after he, uh, he you know, that was the, the map that he, that he drew. And then uh, everyone takes turns and they kind of talk about, you know, what they saw in their map analysis. And so I, I love this picture of Lance. And that's Alicia Bentley, one of Lance's uh, former students in the background that works at, at EMC. So, so that's how we start our uh, convective outlook generation process. We do these map analyses. Um, and then, yeah, so we do a number of different types of outlooks. So we'll do a full period, day one probabilistic forecast of total severe or like any type of severe, you know, counts as an event. Uh, the severe hazards desk, they focus on individual severe weather types. So they generate separate outlooks for tornado, um, wind, and hail. And both of the, uh, the desks had separate um, kind of experimental products. Uh, the hazards desk did these conditional intensity forecasts of the individual Hazards, so it was kind of like, well, if this event occurs, you know, how severe will it be? And there were like different categories of severity that they would predict. Uh, and then over at the innovation desk, we did these potential severe timing areas. And so, you know, you have this kind of like full period outlook, but then we uh, tried to use these PSTs, as we called them, um, to highlight four hour time chunks when the severe weather. Um, so it's just kind of a different way to add. Uh, more precise information uh, to the outlooks, which is something that SBC, you know, is really trying to do in kind of, you know, looking into the future. Um, so when we do these outlooks, after we get done, we have a map discussion that's open to the public. Uh, then we have lunch uh, after the map discussion. Uh, and then in the afternoon, uh, we did uh, day two um, outlooks, kind of similar strategy for the different desks. Um, we did the PSDs for day two at the innovation desk. Then we do scientific evaluations. And we have so many different projects and so many different kind of um, experiments, you know, that are falling within the HWT that we have a ton of different scientific evaluations to do. And so we split them between the desks. Um, and I won't go through um, what each of them are, but some of my later slides I'll um, kind of go into some more details on some of them. Um, and then uh, from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m., uh, we do these short-term outlook updates. So over at the innovation desk, we use uh, the Warn on Forecast system, which is this um, high-resolution, uh, rapidly updating uh, ensemble system that is designed to uh, improve the lead times for severe weather, kind of focused in the zero to six hour um, range. It's this big initiative. Have you guys heard of Warren Forecast before? Just let me know. Okay, so you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, so we used Warren Forecast guidance to do um, three different types of outlooks. One, a very short lead time product valid over a one hour time window. Another, um, valid over a four hour time window that also has short lead time. And then another one that we call targeted. So um, the targeted one was always valid from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. Um, and then every hour as we approached 8 p.m. to 9 p.m., we would issue a separate, um, a different outlook. So it's kind of like seeing, you know, as we approach the event, you know, hopefully our forecasts are improving and the Warren and Forecast guidance is kind of like honing in on the areas that are most likely to experience severe weather. Um, okay, so a big part of our recent experiments has been this thing we call the CLUE, uh, which is the Community Leveraged Unified Ensemble. 
Um, and so this was kind of um, partially inspired by this um, UCAR model advisory committee um, that made a number of recommendations to NOAA um, to improve their future operational modeling systems. Um, and a, a big kind of buzzword was, you know, evidence-based decision ma making. And so <coughs> we wanted to kind of be this forum where we could, um, you know, do these experiments focused on kind of optimizing the design of CAM ensembles and kind of providing some of the, the evidence um, to, to help, you know, configure future operational CAM ensembles. Um, so this is just uh, to give you an idea of <laughs> well, what really motivated the clue. Um, this is just a histogram or a bar chart, whatever you want. I guess it's a bar chart, not a histogram. Um, there's a difference. Um, so since 2007, we've had this big increase in the number of models that we look at in the HWT. Um, and by 2016, we realized that you know, we had like six different uh, ensemble systems that we were looking at. And it was like, we got to somehow manage this better. And so the, the clue was a way to do that. So it, it kind of like enforced some constraints on our collaborators. We said, OK, if you're going to contribute, everyone has to use um, you know, the same or provide the data over the same domain. There has to be some you know, control over like the model versions that people are using, uh, and then the products and how they're coded you know, in the group files, that kind of thing, just to make it easier for SPC to process all of this data and to be able to do more controlled you know, comparisons between you know, some ensemble that one person's, one person's contributing versus you know, one that another group is contributing. Um, Greg, yeah? Yeah, so CAPS went away there, I guess, sort of, but they didn't really. Fan, you still had model runs going. So what happened there from so, 16 forward? Yep, so there, that green bar there, um, their systems have been a part of the, the clue system. So, like, okay. you'll notice, like, like just a group of that, then. Okay. Right, yeah. Okay. So, like, NCAR, um, yeah, CAPS, and then the, the, like, the OU map group, Shuang Wang's group, they, they're all kind of, they fall within the, 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 the clue. And we even included, like, the UK Mets ensembles um, in this year's so clue. Instead of having, so, yeah, so UK Mets being completely distinct, which it was in the prior yep. years, you, you've merged it all up. Basically, yeah. Oh, okay. so, so everything that's in the green uh, is provided on the, the same grid, um, the same products, and so there, there's just a lot more consistency to you know, the, the model data that we um, have as part of the HWT. So um, yeah, so everyone kind of agrees on these model specs and post-processing methods, data formats, et cetera. So this is what the clue looked like this year. Um, it become, it's become kind of a beast, uh, and like ahead of time, it's always it's like this big puzzle that you kind of try to fit together. Um, and so we had CAPS, um, which is the Center for Analysis and Prediction of Storms at OU, uh, contributed four different ensemble subsets to the clue. Um, Ezra GSD, they contributed um, the HER, the experimental HER, um, a version of the standalone regional FV3 with the HER physics, and then the HER-E, or the HER ensemble. Um, NCAR contributed their ensemble. Um, the OU MAP group contributed two ensembles where they're um, looking at two different strategies for introducing initial condition perturbations. Um, and the SSL had three contributions there. Um, GFDL had one deterministic version of uh, the FE3. Uh, and then the UK Met Office had these uh, two systems with 2.2 kilometer grid spacing. And this was actually really interesting what they did. Um, so they used their system that they use operationally in the UK um, that you know, is uh, driven by like this, you know, regional ensemble system that they have. Um, and then they, but they just plopped it over the U.S. Um, to see how it would do. You know, it's 2.2 2 .2 kilometer grid spacing, so you would hope that it would, you know, depict storms pretty well and hopefully give some good information about uh, severe weather. Um, and it actually is a very skillful model. Uh, and then the EMC uh, with NOAA contributed. Um, they have a global version of FV3, and then they have um, a similarly configured version that uses the standalone regional um, core. So, so if you're not that familiar with FV3, it's, of course it's the, the, the model that was chosen for NGGPS, and it's going to be the core around which um, you know, NOAA, NOAA unifies all of its uh, modeling systems. Uh, it wasn't designed 
to run uh, over regional domain, um, which was kind of uh, a pretty big limitation because you know you have to be able to run over a regional domain to do like uh, free, you know uh, high resolution and, and rapidly updating you know data simulation. There's all these applications where you just have to have um, you know the capability to run over a regional domain. So um, it took some time to develop that capability. Um, and so one of the tests that we did this year was. Um, you know, we had two different versions of, and this is more of like a sanity check. It's like, okay, does the, uh, the we call it the standalone regional version of FE3, is it giving um, a sane result, basically, that, that looks like the result that you get from a, a global version um, that has a, a nest um, over the conus? So, um, and here are just some of the experiments that we did with the clue this year. We had these uh, stochastic physics perturbation uh, experiment. So the HURI um, has a pretty comprehensive suite of these uh, SPP, or stochastic parameter perturbations, um, applied to the land surface, the PBL, and the microphysics. And as a control at NSSL, um, we ran a version of the HURI um, with all the SPP settings uh, turned off. To, to gauge the impact. Um, so what we really wanted to see was whether there were like practical forecast differences that would matter you know, in a forecasting context. Um, and then the United Kingdom, uh, their unified model, they had two different uh, sets of members. Some of the members overlapped, um, but one used their like operational physics and the other used a set of physics that was kind of tuned for the tropics. Um, and so we wanted to be able to say something about the differences um, in those physics and also gauge the skill of the, the UK systems against the US ones. Uh, and then we had um, these experiments where um, we were just looking at the physics sensitivities um, in the FV3. Um, and so they have this uh, physics driver that was recently implemented called the CCPP, the Common Community Physics Package, um, where you can just swap different schemes, um, you know, in and out. It's, it's the, the general idea there, and it didn't have a capability to do that. So um, that was one. And then, uh, oh, like I explained earlier, we had this global with Nest versus SAR FV3 comparison um, through the contributions of EMC. Um, and then we wanted to have this uh, comparison between uh, operational HER, the experimental HER, and then the uh, version of SAR-FE3 with the HER physics. Um, and then there were a number of um, you know, things that happened. Configurations were changing during the experiment. The shutdown had a big impact on being able to spin things up before the experiment started so that we would have a constant uh, configuration. So, so we really didn't do much with those comparisons. Um, and then we have all these different data simulation methods that we were able to um, compare through um, several of the ensemble um, subsets. So, um, oh, and then we had the war on forecast system. Um, so this is, um, yeah, I mentioned this earlier, but this is an activity that we did from 3 to 4 o'clock. We had those different um, types of outlooks, the short, the long, and the targeted. Um, and what was kind of neat um, about this is that uh, the the forecasters were able to issue their own outlooks on these Google Chromebooks that we bought for the HWT. Um, and we have this nice kind of like um, interface that allows us to, to draw these outlooks. Um, and for the first time, we extended this activity um, all the way to 8 p.m. So in the past, we've always ended at, at 4 o'clock for everybody. But this year, we brought in two people each week that would come in at noon uh, and so instead of doing 8 to 4, these forecasters did noon to 8. And from 4 to 8 o'clock, um, they were issuing outlooks only using the, the worn on forecast system. So that was kind of a neat thing. And, you know, in the previous years, we had ran this uh, worn on forecast system, you know, all the way through the evening. But we have no one that's actually, you know, using the forecast in real time. So we figured, well, you know, we really should figure out how we could do this and kind of better leverage the data sets that we're generating. And so we, you know, we, we did this evening activity. Um, so the Warner Forecast system, it's driven by the HER. Um, the main kind of difference is that the Warner Forecast, um, the cycling is every 15 minutes um, and uh, it assimilates uh, Doppler velocity data, um, MRMS reflectivity, cloud water path. So it's really this like um, rapid 
cycling and then the assimilation of the, the radar data that, that makes it um, quite a bit more, I guess, sophisticated than the HER system. So we do expect, especially at those very short lead times, for it to perform quite a bit better than the HER because of the, the data assimilation that, that it does. Um, so this is the format of those outlooks. Um, I guess I, I don't need to go too much into detail on what, because I already kind of explained it, and it looks really complicated in the table. Um, but just it's every hour we did three outlooks, um, you know, a short, a long, and the targeted. So that's easy, right? Uh, okay, so here's just a list of our objectives. After I get through this, I'm going to get to the good stuff, so don't worry, the, the eye candy. Um, so... You know, every year I think this list gets longer. The ones that are highlighted in red, which I guess I'll say a little bit about, those are the new activities um, or objectives for 2019. So, um, like I said, we extended the uh, warning forecast activity until 8 p.m. Um, oh, this is something new. We, uh, we've never really looked at different analysis systems in the HWT until this year. Um, and so, um, with Research, you know, coming along on the 3D um, RTMA. This is the the real time um, mesoscale analysis system. Um, you know, one one question about you know, the SPC. They use their own um, surface objective analysis. They call it the the, the meso A, or, um, and it's on a 40 kilometer grid, so it's pretty coarse. I um, mean, it's just based on like a one hour. Wrap forecast, and then they kind of just slide in the surface observations, you know, at the surface, and then they derive all their, um, you know, the severe weather fields and environmental parameters from that. So it's a, kind of a crude um, analysis, but it actually works really well. Um, but of course, you know, there should be room for improvement. Um, so we, we had this comparison between the 3D RTMA um, and their, their mesoscale analysis. Um, and then there was like two other analysis systems in, in there too that we looked at. Um, and so that was kind of a neat activity that we did um, in the afternoon. Um, oh, and then documenting the skill of a SAR FE3 CAM ensemble. So uh, CAPS contributed um, the SAR FE3 ensemble. And this is the first time that we've actually had an ensemble using um, SAR FE3. So that was an interesting activity. And then the collaboration with the UK Met Office was new for this year. Um, oh, and then uh, we've, we've had a project with uh, Texas Tech um, using ensemble sensitivity analysis um, to derive um, basically different types of severe weather probabilities. So through the sensitivity analysis, um, you can kind of figure out what are the ensemble members that are lo most likely to be uh, more skillful than the other members? And so we had this comparison between this supposed subset of skillful members versus the entire ensemble to see if the technique actually worked. Um, so sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> um, and then just to give you an idea of what the HWT has become. <laughs> so we integrate a lot of uh, funded projects into the HWT now. So we have all these different, um, you know, federal funding um, opportunities that were um, that, that work with the HWT. So the, the JTTI, um, the uh, there's a, a test beds um, call, um, the, the C Star, and you know, so there's all these different um, proposals that we um, integrate and. So it's, it's really fun getting to work with all these different people. And, you know, the, the process in the HWT is a little bit more formalized because of, um, you know, it, it, figuring out how to integrate all these proposals um, into it. Um, but I think the same kind of spirit that we've had since the beginning is still there, which is really like forecasters and researchers coming together, collaborating, you know, trying to figure things out. Um, so uh, you may see a lot of familiar names. Uh, Jamie, you're on here. Isadora, Tara Jensen at DTC, Glenn Romine at NCAR. Uh, let's see, there's Glenn again. I'm on there. I have a project. Uh, and let's see, oh, and Curtis Alexander has uh, two projects on there. So 19 total projects is what I counted. Um, so it's a lot. It's a lot of work figuring out how everything kind of fits together. Um, so this was actually in uh, 2018 that we, we hired this guy right here. Um, this is the only picture that I could find of him, and I guess he's not very photogenic, but he said I could use this. Um, 
<laughs> so, so Brett Roberts, this is, so this is Brett Roberts. Um, he uh, was a uh, graduate student at OU, got his PhD at OU. Uh, but he also, while he was a grad student, he developed um, this website called Pivotal Weather. And I don't, do you guys know, have you, you ever used Pivotal Weather? Well, for severe weather nerds like me, it's like the super popular um, forecasting uh, web page. Um, really neatly designed, and Brett's been doing like web development stuff on the side, you know, since he was an undergrad. Um, and so we realized that oh, we got to snatch this guy up after you know he gets his PhD because our websites for the HWT Morris. Maybe you remember what the websites were like were terrible. They were like you know HTML from like the 1990s, you know. So um, so Brett came in and he just uh, made everything awesome. So really uh, improved everything with all of our uh, web pages and interfaces for doing model comparisons. And just an example of um, this is just showing you know how we do some of the model comparisons and what the interface looks like. Um, you know you have this rollover. You know you just go to the rollover the different forecast times. Then you can display different fields, um, and then you can uh, you know make it loop automatically, uh, and then. Uh, there's little, it's hard to see, I guess, but you can click on and off like different probability contours. Um, if you want to click off the, um, like this is showing max UH from different ensembles, you can click that off and just show the probabilities. And then you can overlay, this is what I'm doing now, overlay um, different types of severe weather reports on top of the model data. Um, so there's like all this flexibility uh, built in um, that helps us really you know, thoroughly kind of evaluate, you know, how the model does. So, so Brett has done, like, awesome things um, for us, um, you know, with the, the visualization and, and the web stuff. Another example of what Brett did for us, um, we have this drawing tool now, so we can display uh, our ensemble data in different ways, um, and then draw our own outlooks. So this is what we use the Chromebooks for, uh, is you know we'll divide our participants into groups and have them issue their own outlooks using different parts of the uh, clue. Um, so we'll say, okay, you're assigned this data set. You know, use it to make a forecast and tell us what you saw. And so this is me just using one particular data set to issue a probabilistic tornado forecast. And so you can just see how slick it is. It's it's very easy. Um, very user friendly. I'm drawing the, I did the two, the five, now I'm drawing a 15% contour. Um, and I like to go big, so I'm going to add a 30 uh, contour in there. And I'm kind of cheating because I, when I drew this, I actually knew what happened. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. But it just, you know, it's just an example of, uh, you know, what we have our participants uh, do. That was one of the, Suggestions we got early on it was like, oh, I, you know, I love seeing all this stuff, but I want to be able to do some of this like myself uh, and, and manipulate the data and, and and that kind of thing. And so we really tried hard, and, and bringing Brett in was like a huge, you know, benefit and helped us do that. So, um, okay, so now I think I've that's like everything that we did in the experiment, right? So, so now some of the highlights. Um, you know, every year there's like, you know, well. I guess it's not. Some years just really suck and not a lot happens and it's kind of boring. Um, but I can't, we haven't really had any recent years like that. Um, but this year, I, we had probably one of the biggest, um, well, it's funny because it wasn't an act, it, it was kind of a bust because, um, you know, we had a high risk. Um, that's why I say it's a mega high impact non event. Um, the forecast was for there to be a historic outbreak of tornadoes Oklahoma, in Oklahoma. And everything, everything that we looked at suggested that it was going to happen, and it was a slam dunk. Um, in fact, um, even the lead forecaster, John Hart, who has 20 years of forecasting experience, he told me that up to 2 o'clock on that day, he was becoming even more and more confident that we were going to have this tornado outbreak. You know, everything was pointing towards um, supercells initiating in, in Oklahoma. Uh, and then after about 2 o'clock, uh, when things started not happening, <laughs> it was like, ooh, that, that kind of, you know, went, went down. Uh, so this day, um, the risk was advertised uh, several days out. 
Um, on day three, SPC issued a moderate, which is very rare for them to do. And they started including outlooks for this day seven days out. So, I mean, it was, you know, this, you know, big honking, you know, wave coming in from the west. It was very predictable. You know, you probably would have seen uh, signs of it like 10 days out. Um, so, uh, historic outbreak was expected. The day before, so on Sunday night before this event, um, it was getting so much hype um, that the University of Oklahoma, um, they closed, all the public schools closed. Um, and so I was kind of taken off guard, and I got a text message from um, one of the SIMS scientists that uh, does support work in the HWT. And she was like, well, I'm OU SIMS. You know, OU's closed. You know, technically, we're not even supposed to come in. And I, I was like, oh, crap. Like, you have to come in. <laughs> like, this is why we have the experiment. So, um, so we had to have the, one of the, tri- the Sims admins, you know, kind of send out a message like saying, okay, we do expect all the HWT sports staff um, to come in, um, you know, because this is like, why you do your job. <laughs> uh, so, and we also had to, I sent out emails to the participants because they, you know, they all heard that OU was closed. And so it was like, well, you know, this is an OU building. Um, should we, is the experiment on? So, and of course we told everyone, yes, the experiment's on. Um, but, but the reason for the closures is that, the, I mean, the forecasts were suggesting tornadoes could start early in the day. And uh, this was uh, the, the anniversary of you know the 2013 Moore tornado, which was also early in the day, and you know went over several schools, so it's like everyone's kind of like, oh my god, you know this you know could happen again. Just everything's off. We're not going to you know take any risk on a day like this. So it was. It's in my top three days like ever in the HWT, just in terms of like kind of the anxiety and the excitement and and, and that kind of thing. So forecasting weather in real time can be really stressful. Uh, the local meteorologist um, tweeted this out on Sunday night, um, and so uh, it, basically saying, you know, he's never seen the metro Oklahoma City under a continuous tornado threat for this long. Uh, literally 1 p.m. to 1 a.m., um, multiple tornado strikes in the metro, quite possible, large violent tornadoes, also severe flooding. Um, so. You know, our meteorologists in Oklahoma, they like to hype um, events, like, a lot. Uh, And this event was no different. But this kind of a tweet was just, like, a whole new level of of hype. And my wife, she asked me, like, um, is this, you know, is this right? And I had kind of looked at the forecast and everything. And I was like, well, I kind of agree with them. Like, it does look like this is what's going to happen. So it was scary. Uh, And then this was the the, um, outlook the SPC issued on this day. Um, you know, it was a high risk, um, and they went with, uh, these are the tornado probabilities, 45% tornado probabilities, which you rarely see. Uh, the, the super outbreak of April 27, 2011, I think they, in one of their updates, they, they went up to like 60, which is the highest that they will go. Um, and this is just showing that they issued a particularly dangerous situation tornado watch by, I think it was by noon-ish or, or something. So, uh, yeah, it was, you know, it was nuts. So just to put this in bro- a broader context, um, the last half of May was very active. So it wasn't just like that one day, um, but we had a lot of tornadoes in the last half of May um, in the central U.S., um, a- about twice more uh, than normal. Um, so I thought I would just pose this question because it was something that we talked about a lot this year in the HWT. Um, what is the earliest that we could have said that the last half of May would be much more active than normal? What do you guys think? It's the day after. Yeah. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> like a month in advance, only a week, three days in advance. Like, I don't know. What do you think? All right, you guys are no fun. Come on. <laughs> so, all right, I'll just go on and I'll. Why would we think you could make that prediction? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. We think I think it's an unpredictable 
-hmm. Okay, we're talking about, there are, for things like, um, you know, drought um, and, uh, sure, like, wow. seasonal forecasts of, of temperature, those types of things, pattern, you, you can make... A pattern two weeks in advance. Right. Yeah. It looks favorable. And, and severe, weather, severe weather is a little bit different, but it still comes down to, you know, there being a favorable you know, than a pattern. Range. Right, yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, there's this group of, uh, I don't know, maybe you call them a bunch of misfits, um, but, but they do, they've been doing this sub-seasonal tornado forecasting. And uh, the last half of this May was kind of like their dream come true. Um, so they issued, they call them ERTAFs, Extended Range Tornado Activity Forecasts. Um, and they issue these outlooks for two and three weeks um, in advance. All they're doing is saying two weeks from now, uh, is this one week period going to be below average or above average? Um, and, and then they can go back and you know just look at the reports and, and evaluate how they did. So um, this group: Victor Gensini, Brad Barrett, John Allen, David Gold, Allen, Mara Nara, Mike Ventris. Maybe you recognize some of those names. And so. Uh, part of their forecasting is based on this relationship. Um, the, this is from uh, a paper from Gensini and Marinaro, 2016. So there is this relation between the global wind oscillation uh, and tornado frequencies in the central, or it, actually across the, the, the U.S. Um, and so the, the, the global wind oscillation is, is pretty closely, I think the correlation is like 0.5 correlated with the MJO. So essentially they're kind of like looking for uh, MJO events. Events. Um, and, and these are like these forecasts of opportunity. If you have um, all of a sudden you get an amplified MJO, you know, over the Indian Ocean that progresses um, to the east. Um, so this is the basic idea. You know, MJO event happens um, when when the enhanced convection moves out um, over the the Pacific. Um, you know, you're transferring momentum uh, into the north latitude jet stream, um, and then this enhanced jet extends to the east. If you have a blocking high over the North Pacific, then you can have this wave breaking and subsequent troughing over the western U.S. Um, so this happened in late April, this MJO event amplified in the Indian Ocean. You can see it um, uh, in the MJO phase space uh, right here. This is the part um, of the, the space that, you know, is over the, the Indian Ocean. Um, and the IRTAF group, uh, when I talked to Victor about this, he said that this, you know, we haven't had a big MJO event in the spring for like 10 years. And so um, this was like a very, like, obvious test for, okay, is this actually going to work if we have an MJO that forms in late April? You know, we should be able to say that as it, you know, progresses, that at some point, you know, the last half of May, we're going to have enhanced severe activity. Um, and so they began, they issued these um, outlooks, um, and, and they started talking about it on April 21st. Um, so they said, you know, they're calling it this forecast of opportunity, um, uh, and they're, uh, you know, beginning of week four, um, and then a week later, um, you know, things were, you know, the MJO event was really obvious, um, and they were talking about, you know, the enhanced activity um, around the middle of week three, and yeah, the, the above average forecast would hold off until uh, beyond um, 18 May. So it's kind of a, they're making this is April 28th, and they're making forecasts for you know um, severe weather um, past May 18th. So um, I don't know. Uh, they got it right though. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know if it's just luck. Um, but it, it was something that we talked about because we had Victor there during the first week of the experiment and he presented, you know, this material and he went out on a limb and he was like, you know, I am highly confident that the last half of May is going to be, you know, really active for severe weather. Uh, and it was. So anyway, cool stuff, I thought. Um, so just to get into, you know, some of the actual forecast data from the May 20 event, um, the SPC has this really nice um, forecast viewer for the HREF ensemble, the high-resolution ensemble forecast system. So this is essentially the operational CAM ensemble run at, at EMC. And so this is just showing the 500 millibar heights and winds. Um, and you can overlay the outlook. So this is where the high risk was. And then I can just, you know, loop this. So it's just you know, a big honking trough um, coming out into the plains. Um, and what was really, you know, there's no, you'll notice like in the Gulf, there's 
there's no like cut off low or anything. There was this deep feed of moisture, you know, days in advance from the from the tropics, from the deep tropics. Um, so, um, you know, a lot of times if you have a big trough move in, m- maybe you don't have the moisture return yet. This case definitely had the, the moisture uh, return. So this is just showing what the forecast dew points were. Um, this is just an ensemble mean. You see the outlook overlaid there. Um, the purples are dew points above uh, 70. And so um, here I can, so if you go to like, whoops. Yeah, here's like the uh, zero Z. You did have a, you can kind of see that there was a frontal boundary draped across um, central Oklahoma. That was actually kind of like enhanced by elevated convection to the north too. Um, but the dry line was way out in the western Texas panhandle. So it wasn't like your typical, you know, Oklahoma setup where you have like a dry line across central Oklahoma. Um, you know, there wasn't a really obvious like initiation mechanism um, other than this frontal boundary. But the frontal boundary you know, was initiating storms, but they were just moving north of the boundary and becoming elevated. So it really wasn't helping with like warm se- sector supercells. Um, so that was kind of like the big question was, well, how was, were storms going to initiate? Um, the, the height falls, um, you know, as you progress through the day, they're actually really, really subtle. So there wasn't really strong forcing for ascent. And the main trough didn't come through until the night. Um, but sometimes with big outbreaks, that's what you want. You don't want the forecast or the, the forcing to be too strong. Otherwise, everything goes up at once and congeals into a line. So it actually can be good to have like subtle forcing. Um, so, so we're kind of, you know, like weighing all these things when we're considering, you know, what's going to happen. Um, and this, I thought, was a really cool graphic that we recently put on this website. Um, this is showing, here, I'll just stop it right there. Um, the significant tornado parameter, which combines, you know, like the height of the LCL, um, the um, mixed layer cape, um, the surface, or the like zero to one kilometer storm relative, you know, all these parameters that are important for tornadoes are kind of combined into one index. Um, and so um, the purples that you see across central Oklahoma are STPs greater than eight. Um, and if you look at like the distributions of, of violent tornadoes, like EF4 plus, um, an eight STP is like the upper range of, you know, uh, the STPs associated with violent tornadoes. So it is like a really high value. And uh, the fact, you know, sometimes you'll see high STP, um, but you won't see any storms that are forming in that environment. So with this graphic, we put the forecast storms from the HRF members. Um, we showed the, the updraft helicity tracks in black, um, and they're all happening in the environment with the really high STP. So that was like, you know, this really strong signal to us that not only are we going to have storms, but they're going to be occurring where the environment is just ready to go for tornadoes. And so here I'll just let this go, kind of animate through uh, a couple of times. So when I saw this, I was like, oh yeah, we're, it's going to happen. Um, but the atmosphere likes to mess with us. So. <laughs> Greg, I hope you don't mind that I put this on here, but I, I, I gave you credit for it. So. <laughs> I thought this was awesome. So, so since you put this on here, go ahead. And, okay, here, I'll show this. I'm going to say that I was surprised how everybody was going so gonzo with all that low-level clouds predicted. Yeah. So this is, uh, well, tell me, what, what, what am I showing here? It's a fake satellite, uh, visible satellite image from the model data directly. From and this is a really high resolution? 600 meter grid Okay, space. yeah, that's what I thought. Um, but only for the first half, while that square in the center of where Oklahoma's present, it was a 600 meter grid spacing, and then that turns off after day one. So uh, okay. it's, it's 24 hours of 600 meters only, and then three kilometer hurricane yeah. grid otherwise. So I remember you, I think, sent this to me in an email yeah, just on this day. Yeah, on an airplane. That's right. You. Yeah. Um, and this got me really excited. I was like, oh. I mean, but it basically matched like all the other guidance yeah, from this day. Um, so here, I'll, let me just stop it at. So what ha- this is at valid at like yeah here's this is the morning still, so um, fourteen fifteen valid time yeah so so, two, so two. some of the the forcing was kind of coming out you know into the plains and so all this elevated convection 
initiated over the Texas Panhandle, and there was already a service boundary that was kind of across you know, uh, the North Texas Panhandle and Northern Oklahoma. And so this elevated convection kind of reinforced that boundary. And what's cool is, look at that. You can really see it clearly right there. Um, and this is kind of what it looked like in the observed visible satellite, too. So it's just really neat to me that you could see these, like, features that you see in the observed satellite in a model. With um, a big caveat, though, a lot more of the southern region had a lot more widespread cloud cover than yeah, any model right. had, which is why you get all the high capes, because you had all the sunshine yeah. in the model that you didn't have as much of in real life. Yep. Um, so... But, and so what you see, so I think th and th there was enough heating, and if you look south of this boundary, um, yeah, a few storms just boom, explode. And that's, it's hard to see the outline of Oklahoma here, but like the metro is like right in here. Uh, I, mean, in, I mean, it was just blowing up supercells right over the metro. So um, again, we thought we were all, you know, all our houses were going to be destroyed. Yeah. Yeah, so that was fun. <laughs> well, it's not a bust in the regard to the existence of severe convection. Oh, that exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so I mean, if you look when you look at like the uh, the outlooks with the reports overlaid on them, it's like, oh, that's pretty good because there were several tornadoes that occurred within the high risk, um, and there was uh, initiation of storms along the dry line in the Texas Panhandle, and those storms produced tornadoes. Um, but they grew upscale pretty fast, um, and, and there weren't like strong, violent, long track tornadoes. Um, so, so the scenario um, that was being forecast um, didn't really things didn't evolve as as predicted. I'll just say that. But yeah, you're right that it was a pretty significant severe weather event, like nonetheless. Um, okay, all right. So these are um, just some of, some of the forecasts. Um, and what I'll do, let's see. Yeah, I'll just, so these are, ver the top row are different versions of FV3. And uh, these are the global um, with Nest versions of FV3 just run by different agencies. Um, and these were not good forecasts. Um, so if you want to, you know, knock the FV3, then this is a good plot for it. So Morris. Uh, <laughs> um, so they, they really, yeah, they grew things upscale too fast um, into this big line, and you had these big meaty-looking storms that, um, yeah, weren't very realistic. Well, that uh, Nissel SAR matches the obstacle. Yeah, and, and that's what I was going to uh, get to. Um, so the, the one exception, yeah, is the, the middle bottom. And so this is a, a version of the, the SAR V3 that we just started running at NSSL, um, and we, so it's the most recent version, uh, and we put Thompson, Greg, your physics in there, and then uh, MYNN uh, PBL scheme uh, in there. And it actually performed really good. So, I mean, compare it to with what happened. It was one of the only models that did not uh, produce supercells um, in the warm sector. Uh, so, so, I mean, it was kind of kind of incredible, but of course, at the time, we just completely dismissed it because everything else like had you know supercells, and it's like, oh, this can't possibly be the one model that verifies. <laughs> well, I have to boast that the NCAR ensemble also didn't produce supercells in the warm sector. So okay, well, I'm sure. So, I think did any of the members produce uh, supercells? One or two out of ten. Okay, day. yeah. Okay, so we'll give the NCAR Ensemble some love, too. I, I'm okay with that. I like the NCAR Ensemble. <laughs> um, so this is showing the... Uh, oh, wait. Yeah, here we go. So this, I'll just... Yeah, this is at, at 1Z. Um, actually, let me bring it back to more like... Uh, one more back. Yeah, so 22Z, uh, the operational HER is up here. So it, it had um, multiple runs with lots of supercells in the warm sector. The experimental HER did the same thing. Um, the, this version of, of SAR V3 that was run by CAPS um, with different physics than the NSSL version, it just had storms everywhere. Um, and then uh, the UK MET, it's kind of interesting. It, it had weak storms. Um, over, over central Oklahoma in the warm sector. So it was kind of a mixed signal, I felt like. And then here's the OBS on the right. Um, so we, you know, th these were the, we, we 
um, rated these forecasts you know, every day and assigned them uh, ratings. And this is just an example of some of the average ratings. So on this day, the Nissel SAR FE3 got rated the highest, 7.9 was its average rating. And then these, uh, the version of uh, FE3 run at EMC got a lower rating, and then the HER also got a low rating. Aggregated over, now don't like, go like, you know, yelling this to, to everybody, um, this, this result, because there's some caveats with it. But uh, the Nissel SAR FE3, on average, across the entire experiment, the subjective ratings ended up being higher uh, than the HER. So we're definitely going to look more into this. One of the caveats is that the evaluations were done in different groups of models. So the SAR FE3 was not beside the HER when we did these, these ratings. So it could be that just the other models that the HER was evaluated alongside may have you know, influenced what the relative ratings were. But in any case, it was a really good result um, that, that the SAR FE3 um, performed that well. So, okay, so what happened? Um, so this is the, the sounding um, at OUN at 21Z. And this is actually, this is like something to behold if you're like a severe weather junkie. Um, so, um, I mean, there's basically, if you look, there's like five joules per kilogram of uh, mixed layer sin. But other, I mean, you're pretty much uncapped. The hodograph, I've, I don't know if I've ever seen um, a hodograph where the, the low level shear was that ridiculous. The zero to one SRH is like, you know, 344. Um, zero to three is like 474. So it's like things are just, you know, ready to go. Maybe the, the only bad thing maybe I could say about the sounding, um, the, the lapse rate in this layer is only seven. Um, you know, a lot of times in, in really juiced up environments, you can get a lot higher lapse rates than that. So it, maybe that had something to do with um, why you couldn't get storms to... I'm dying to know why you don't want to see a classic inverted V at least down below, the, you know, 900 millibars or whatever, because that does not have... 78 over 72 does not look that impressive. Mm -hmm. it's, that, moist to, it's moist to 700 millibars. It's incredibly moist to 700 millibars. Well, that was, well, that was what was weird about this day. It was yeah. not your typical, like, Oklahoma severe weather environment. Right. There's right. more like a southeast, um, like, right. April right. outbreak. And that's... It works fine. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And so... We, and wait till you see the comparison that I have here. Um, so, this is 21Z. Here's what happened... Um, and I wish I could line these up a little bit better. But this is what happened three hours later. Look at, and I don't know how important this is, but it was just like interesting. So this inversion sharpened and lowered. So it implied that there was like substance, um, you know, sinking motion yeah. going on. Um, and that had to have had something to do with there not being um, initiation in the warm sector. And these really sharp inversions, the models do not do well with them. They, they smooth them out. Sometimes you can't even see them um, you know, in, in the model profiles. So, so I, I'm pretty convinced that that had something to do with what was going on um, on this day. So Adam, by this time, there's strong convection to the north of OUA by this yeah. hour. Yep. So how much of this could just literally be compensating subsidence from the northern Well, schools? if you looked at um, the Dallas Fort Worth sounding from earlier in the day, you had just a, the, it was just a massive, um, you know, of elevated mix like the, this. Real, so we were actually thinking that it was being infected in from the south, because um, that boundary, like, I mean, I think that's, you know, a, that could have happened, but it was pretty far, you know, to the north by by the early evening. So I don't know. Um, and so somebody, it was actually Patrick Marsh the next day, he, he showed this and, and put the two soundings side by side. This is what the Birmingham, Alabama sounding looked like at 18Z on uh, April 27th, 2011. <laughs> Just look at, look at the similarity. Uh, so, so, you know, it got pointed out, oh, you know, like that sharp inversion, imply substance, blah, blah. Well, but what about Birmingham, Alabama in, in, in you know, 2011? Um, but and somebody else pointed out, it's like, well, that was at 18Z. You know, it was the environment did evolve as you got into the 
um, you know, later in the day for, for that event. So, Yeah, right. um, if you watch the evolution in Alabama that day, the inversion was steadily being lifted out. Yeah. Wow, in, in your case, it was developing with time. And I, do, I, I think that's the main difference. So, yeah, good point. Um, but it was just, I was amazed at how similar, you know, the, the, the height of the, the moist layer was almost exactly the same, you know, just above 700 millibars. And um, so, and actually the, um, the, the low level shear was actually even more ridiculous um, at, in, in Oklahoma on this day. But, but actually, this is early in the day um, for that Alabama case. So I'm guessing that the low level shear probably even got better um, with time. So, so anyway, um, yeah, these were kind of our hypotheses for what went wrong. You had subsidence. You know, there was no trigger. Like I said, the dry line was well to the west, um, and the strong height falls didn't arrive until later. Um, there may have been clues from the models. Um, one thing that was kind of weird, the UH wasn't particularly strong. You know, usually with supercell outbreaks, you'll see really high values, long tracks. But you saw the long tracks, but not the high values. So. Um, to me, that was a clue that maybe the model storms weren't quite, you know, realizing this really awesome environment that they were in, and they may have been, like, slightly um, elevated. Um, uh, and, yeah, so like Greg pointed out, this was not a uh, typical Oklahoma um, environment, which I think we the forecasters struggled with a little bit just because it was just so atypical. So, um, so I'm going to... This is, I just had another case study from Warn on Forecast. This was a more recent event. This is the observed reflectivity. This is from July 19th, a really high-end severe wind event that happened over Wisconsin. Um, and those uh, outlines there, the black and the gray, is just showing the um, observed, the azimuthal um, shear. So these are the Warn on Forecast um, animations from that day. The OBS are overlaid in the gray, and individual ensemble member reflectivity forecasts are shown in the colors. So you just get a feel for, you know, the, the members did a really good job of tracking and also kind of mirroring the same convective structure um, as the, the observed storms. Um, and yeah, so this was a big success case for one on forecast, and we didn't really have any good, good success cases from doing the experiment. So we got this one in late July, and it was like, yes! <laughs> and so hence I am now showing it to everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, those... Uh, yeah, th this is some of what we plan to do in the future uh, with the, the experiment. These are this is just kind of a brain dump, but you know, FV three, of course, because it's the model that was chosen for NGGPS is really important, and so all the NOAA labs are really trying to make it great. Um, we want to be able to beat the operational CAM ensemble with a single core, so we're working on that. Um, we're working on evolving Warner forecast. Um, also, I think in future experiments, artificial intelligence as a way to calibrate uh, forecasts, which is actually why I'm here doing a project with my grad student that's focused on machine learning. Um, that, I think, is a, a really great avenue for improving post-processing uh, high-resolution guidance. So, so that's it. Sorry, it went kind of long, but you guys were talking back at me, so it's your fault. So. <laughs> Course. Well, I'm going to pass oh. the mic around. I know we didn't use it the entire time we were bantering, but anyway, we'll do it now for those online. Thanks. I'm sorry for being so vocal, but again, I, I think, you know, all the emphasis on the tornado aspect of the day, it's kind of, I mean, there was a huge flash flooding event. That yeah. The model was captured really well. Yep. The severe in general was captured really well. Um, so... Again, is it's really the big bust that people, uh, you know, are declaring it to be? Yeah. Convective mode obviously is still one of the big issues with yeah. cams, um, but in terms of the overall risk that were involved on this event, I think it was pretty good. All the forecasts were picking up on the risk. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. And uh, the weather service with the flash flood threat, they hit it really hard. Um, so they do deserve a lot of credit for um, 
you know, real, and that's for, based on past experience. Um, we had one previous event, it was May 31st, 2013, when there was a really big tornado risk that evolved into a flash flood risk. And actually several people died in the Oklahoma City metro that were taking shelter from tornadoes and ended up having floodwaters that came into where they were taking shelter. And so that got a lot of attention. And now the local, op- they're really, you know, when events like this happen, the transition from tornado to flash flood, they, they really communicate it well. And they did in this case, um, especially. So, so yeah, when it, I guess the one thing, you're right, the one thing that was a bust was the, the afternoon tornado threat, but the evolution of all the other convective modes was, was forecast pretty well. So, yeah, good point. Other questions, comments? mention a funny thing. Anders and I flew to, to come down to HWT. Andrew Jensen and I flew down there on that day, the 20th, and our flight was leaving Denver at 2 p.m., which was a joke, right? You're going 2 p.m. on a PDS day down in Oklahoma City, and that's where we're supposed to be flying into. And uh, we got de-iced. Or no, we didn't get de-iced, but it was snowing in Denver before we left. <laughs> and the planes were being de-iced. And we took off, and they said, we're going to try to thread a needle here, everybody. And we get about halfway there. And said, so, well, we knew this was going to happen. We're going to have to take a, 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 a much longer route. We almost went to Arkansas. So from, draw your line, Denver to Oklahoma City, we almost went to Arkansas, then back in from the east. But we did land an hour later than, well, we left an hour late, an extra hour in the air, so two hours extra total then landed in Oklahoma City, got in the rental car and said, where, where are these supercells? Where do we go? Where do we go? And then there was nowhere to go. <laughs> it should also be mentioned that, that Greg is not a stranger to travel problems during the HWT. <laughs> you were out on May 31st, 2013, and I, and I think yeah. you were, were you headed to the airport or were you chasing? We were headed to the airport and decided we'll go chase the storm on our way there. Okay, yeah. yeah. And there was literally a tornado like that. It didn't, I don't know if it hit Will Rogers, but it was really close yeah, to Will Rogers Airport. Not a good, day. Not a good yeah. day. Yeah. Um, But I want to say it's a great experience. Whoever hasn't gone down there and done, and done this, it's a, it's a marvelous experience. Um, you do gain an awful lot. There's some parts of it that aren't so fun for a microphysics developer like me, but <laughs> it's also great stuff. Yeah. It's actually, what's cool is when we have Greg in the room along with like Hugh Morrison uh, and... Um, Jason Milbrandt, uh, Milbrand, <laughs> uh, you know, and to put all these microphysics geeks together and have them, you know, it's kind of funny hearing, you know, their, their lingo and everything that I don't understand. But then whenever I have questions about anything, they're always really good at, you know, explaining how things work um, to me. And, to, and actually to all the other people that have no idea, you know, what the complexities are, you know, and these, to have the actual developers in the room and it, w- with these people that would never have the opportunity to have the ear of someone like Greg, it's really cool. It's one of the, the things that I think make the experiment really you know, useful to, to like forecasters um, and, and others, and students. And, so. and the last tip that I can say is for sure that I gained a lot on my first real visit down there because these guys are sitting staring at those radar images every single day. I'm sitting here writing lines of code, and... They go. They show up a histogram of reflectivities, and show up the next red histogram. And you're like, "Why didn't you tell me this thing had a high bias all along? I think I can <laughs> fix that." Because I don't have time to look at daily weather forecasts like these guys do. I don't have the intensity that they do that. But in one day, I can go, "Oh, I know what's causing that." After I hit myself on the head for, you know, yeah. what, what was it? What was in the code that you didn't realize could cause you so much headache? It's worth every minute of it to hear with these operational forecasters see in the details that you can't look at everything possible. Yeah. Thanks, Craig. I appreciate that. You, <laughs> you, guys, you guys do a great job hosting a, a huge number of people, yeah. too. It's tough in that room. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. You need to double the space. <laughs> I know. Uh, about the clue experiment, uh-huh. I'm quite new on this topic, but it's really interesting. Um, so you are standardizing the models, uh, the grid cells and everything, you kind of join many of the um, configurations uh-huh. uh, of some of them during the years, but some others are not included in that clue group. Oh, yeah. And do you think that's important to standardize all of them, or it's good to have different? Yeah, that's a good question. So so some of the 
contributions just don't naturally fit within the Clue framework. So, um, like the, the I included the Warner forecast system in that graph, and uh, so the Clue we try to limit to uh, zero Z initializations. Um, so we say you know everything in, initialized at zero Z, you know abide by these constraints, but the other stuff, you know, um, will kind of let let it be its own thing. Any big teasers for next year? What's going to be new? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> gosh. Well, we've been talking about what we're going to do for Warren Forecast, and uh, we don't know what we're going to do yet, but I've been kind of pushing that we should really be trying to push the envelope and do something kind of crazy. Um, you know, like do like one kilometer uh, ensemble forecast. Um, or even have an experiment where we have, you know, we have 18 ensemble members, which I think is big time overkill, because um, and it's kind of under dispersive anyway. So you're kind of over, you have more members than you need. So we could design an experiment where, you know, say half of the members would use one kilometer, half of them would, would use three kilometer, and we would try to quantify what, if any, value you know one kilometer is providing. I mean, I'm convinced that. There is definitely going to be value at, at one kilometer. I think some recent, like Ryan Sobash and Craig, have done some work that that shows there is value. Um, but in a in a practical like forecast setting, you know, where you're trying to issue an outlook, is there value? You know, or, or can you? How how do you even squeeze that out? You know, so so that's what I for one forecast. We we may be looking at doing something like that, um, and then. You know, we have a whole new set of, because the, the, the funding, so the, the way these proposals, we have a bunch of them that are ending, and then we're going to have, we have a, now we have, a, we're in the cycle where we have new ones spinning up. So we are, I can't even, yeah, I don't know, like, what all the proposals even, oh, I have a list of them, but we, we have a bunch of new ones now um, that we're going to be, you know, integrating into the experiment. So there will be a lot of new stuff next year. FV3, of course, is going to get um, a lot of emphasis because of its importance to NOAA. Uh, so we want to use MPAS too. <laughs> I kind of Lou Wicker and I have had some discussions, and it's like, well, you know, we're a research laboratory. We should have, you know, some component where we're we're doing like more basic science as opposed to. And a lot of people do do basic, you know, science stuff, but you know, we shouldn't be totally limited to using, um, you know. Noah's model, um, you know, we should be able to, and, and we can, you know. So I, I kind of feel like it's this, we should have somebody on the side that's doing, you know, MPAS forecasts in real time and, and doing those evaluations. It's not something we could get <laughs> funding from NOAA to do, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's like we should find a way to do it, you know. <laughs> well, we should find a way to contribute it. Oh, yeah, I, I think that would be great. We'd be more than happy to, to work with you guys, you know, like we've done in the past, so. Right. Awesome. Well, thank you, Adam. Thank our speaker one more time. And Adam is only here through today. It's my last day, yeah. Last day. So, so if you want to catch him, you have... I've been here the last week and a half. If you want to catch me, you missed out. So. <laughs> all right. Thank you all.